Good morning, everyone. We are reaching the final week of the course. To wrap, our, to wrap up our main lectures, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Felipe Valencia, who will talk about the deep roots of inequality in Latin America. Uh, Felipe is an assistant professor in the Vancouver School of Economics at the University of British Columbia in Canada. He's also a research affiliate at CEPR and at the Institute of Labor Economics. His primary research interests are in economic history, development economics, and economic growth. Please, Felipe. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Fernando, for the introduction and the organizing team for having uh, me and our chapters this week. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I know it's the last week, so congratulations for your long effort. Um, and with you today, uh, I wanted to do two main things. One is going to be to talk about the origins of Latin American inequality, which is the chapter that you're uh, probably already seeing on the screen. Uh, that's going to be an exercise in digging deeper and deeper. There is this literature on the deep roots uh, of historical development, of inequality, of growth in this case. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to do uh, is to present a, a brand new book, uh, which has been a, a work of the last three, four years, uh, where I serve as an editor. So this would also be kind of the book launch uh, of the roots of underdevelopment. So I think I envisioned that the first half an hour, 30 minutes, uh, or 40 minutes max is going to be the origins of Latin American inequality, uh, and the remaining time uh, is going to be the book launch. Uh, of course, as always, your comments and your questions are most encouraged. I would I would leave a few a few minutes for that at the very end, but maybe also um, in the middle. So, without further uh, uh, ado, let me uh, focus on on this chapter. I hope that uh, you're seeing everything on on the screen well. If not, Fernando, you you tell me. Um, and as I was saying before, this is joint work with uh, Francisco Eslava Science, who's a student at the University of British Columbia, uh, finishing his PhD uh, next year. Uh, and here, as I was uh, in, in saying at the beginning, we go deeper and deeper into what are the deep roots of Latin American inequality. So this is gonna be an exercise of focusing on a problem and going deeper and deeper. Uh, by the way, this is a chapter that has been prepared uh, by a fantastic uh, project uh, called La CID, and uh, that has more than 30 chapters on Latin American inequality. Uh, I encourage you to look at that. Uh, I don't know if at some point maybe we can share the link of, of that project uh, as well in, in the chat. So we know, and maybe one of the things that, that, that you've learned in the course already, uh, is that maybe if Latin America is not the most uh, rich region, it's also not the poorest region, but definitely is the most unequal region in the world. So what we do in this chapter is that uh, we survey the literature on the origins of Latin American inequality. So I'm going to show you some descriptive figures of how has the inequality um, statistics and income distribution behaved over time. But this is mostly an exercise in trying to understand what are the deep rooted factors of that inequality. Uh, I'm going to show you some of the uh, seminal papers and then uh, focus on the more modern contributions. And again, this is something that I'm going to continue uh, once we start talking about the book. Um, most of the literature, just, just to, to give you some broad patterns, has moved away from between country studies. So we can call that maybe between inequality. Why is Norway rich and why is Burundi poor? Uh, versus thinking about subnational level differences. So conditional on the level of income of say Ecuador, why are some areas richer and why are some areas poorer? And so that is much closer to probably what we think about inequality, which obviously like is a, is a broad concept. Um, and the literature has also uh, improved upon two things. One, bringing more data to the table. So this is consistent with the cleometric revolution in the United States, just as the book. Uh, and thinking about identification techniques. So I'm not going to be super technical, but I, at least I want to give you intuition of some of the ideas that we have uh, when advancing uh, causation as opposed to correlations. And some of the key chapters, uh, key topics in the chapter are going to be slavery, 
uh, land reform and education. So by no means is this a comprehensive list, but these are the three main ones. And then if there's a, a bit of time, I can talk about things like elites, elites formation, uh, health inequality and wages. And what we're going to do at the end of the chapter, I hope there's time for this, um, is to think about replication. So some famous studies in the literature that look at income, uh, what happens if we look at inequality and what can we learn from those exercises when we go kind of like back to, to some of the classic um, uh, papers in, in the literature. And so maybe there is there, this is this is uh, very informal, but 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 this is perhaps a nice way to see how the interest in Latin American inequality has exploded. Um, and if anything, like this, this uh, secular trend uh, is even higher uh, in times of COVID-19, uh, which, as you know, uh, was a big disruptor of some of the gains of inequality. Uh, or, or, or taking down inequality from the last uh, 10 years or so. So this, this, this interest in, in, in general terms and inequality maps a little bit the secular trends of inequality that we see throughout the century. So this is work by people like Prados de las Cosura and Nora Lustig, uh, where we look at a historical inequality in Latin America. And what you can see is, I mean, and in some cases here, data is, is hard to get by, but a secular increase of inequality during the 20th century. So for instance, if you think about the work of Piketty, here it's trying to do something similar, which is what are the trends of inequality during the last 100 years or, or so? And if anything, we see that this has increased. And with a small decline in the 1990s and especially the 2000s, uh, linked, uh, if you see the, the, the graph on the right, uh, of, uh, for instance, with conditional cash transfers in, in places like Brazil and Mexico, Progresa, Bolsa Familia, Familias de Nación, for instance, in Colombia. And um, so there is a secular increase in inequality during the 20th century, a slight decrease, but then comes COVID 2019, uh, and essentially we're back to square zero. Uh, people like Jose Antonio Ocampo, now the, the current finance and minister of Colombia, talks about a lost decade in Latin America, yet again, similar to what uh, we talked about during the 1980s in this course. And the next thing is a, is a bit of a debate of, is it true that inequality has always been high? Uh, and there's an interesting counterpoint by Jeff Williamson at, at, at Harvard, um, thinking that, I mean, we, it's just very hard to, to know what, what actually happened. And so he creates these guesstimates of like how high or low was inequality in history. You can see the graph here from the four, from right before colonization in 1491, 1492, uh, until the 1920s and kind of like an increase uh, at the very end. And uh, they calculate with Branko Milanovic what is called an inequality possibilities frontier, which is given your level of income, what is the maximum inequality that you could have? And indeed, Nueva España, so what today would be Mexico during the colonial times is very unequal, kind of like at the maximum possible. And but societies that are extremely unequal, like the Chilean society in 1862, could be even more unequal. Okay, so this is an interesting way of seeing what are the maximum levels of inequality that there could be. Uh, and the, the, the big problem, uh, especially when we talk about or think about inequality, is data. So we just don't know how high or low were these levels of inequality for the 15th century onwards up until almost the work that I just showed you here, recovering these trends in the 20th century. Okay, so this is an interesting uh, counterpoint and um, it becomes very messy during post-independence Latin America. Here are some again, uh, take this, this with, a, with a grain of salt, but like some of the patterns that might be observed during the 19th century. Uh, so this big debate, not only in economics, but also in history about independence, is this really revolutionary change or this is just the same old wine in new bottles. So this is economic persistence. Uh, what about things like extension of the franchise? Uh, people like Codsworth arguing that maybe there's not enough inequality in Latin America, a view that I don't subscribe to. Um, things about the importance of trade and commodity booms during the Belle Epoque, I, as the slide that I showed you before. 
and the importance of financing in education, if you think about the work of Aldo Mulsacchio and co-authors, uh, the role of the church, so maybe we it's important to think about assets, uh, in this case, a beautiful paper by Mateo Uribe Castro in the case of Colombia. Okay, so this is just kind of like to give you, to set the scene, um, and I want to show you what is it that we want to explain. And uh, so you've probably seen this map many times uh, already in this class. And um, so not only a rich north, if you see here kind of the, 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 the darker colors in the, in the figure on the right, uh, and a poor south or Latin America, but also a champion in income inequality. And, and one graph where, to be fair, uh, the US doesn't look that great. So probably Canada would be the only uh, truly equitable nation in the, in the Americas. Uh, but the US, as maybe if there's time in the Q&A, we can also discuss this case. I'm mostly going to focus on, on Latin America, uh, appears uh, slightly unequal, uh, on par with some of the countries in, in the region. Uh, but by far, uh, we have some inequality champions in the case of these metrics. Uh, countries like Colombia and Brazil, uh, eventually you're going to see how Chile, uh, for instance, in land inequality is also one of these champions. So this is kind of what, what uh, to set the scene, our starting point. And as I was saying at the beginning, we're going to try to go deeper and deeper into what are some of these roots of inequality. So the rest of the Lassier chapters deal more with contemporary debates, which are obviously very important, things like labor markets, informality, uh, wages, education, health, etc. I'm mostly going to look at history, and of course it's a transversal topic in nature, so some of these other topics uh, are also going to uh, come to light, uh, but mostly it's going to be the historical forces here. Um, and I think there's 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 worse place, uh, uh, places to start than the seminal work of uh, Engerman and Sokolov. It came, comes out first in, in a book edited by Stephen Haver in 1997, How Latin America Fell Behind. And this is just one of these connectedness uh, papers. So you see that a lot of the more modern literature on this uh, topic at the end of the day, is citing Engerman and Sokolov and very much uh, thinking about some of these topics. So the, just to, to be on the same page, the, the idea here is why is there a rich north and a poor south, kind of like the, the graphs that I just showed you? And the answer is, well, it might be because of the original natural endowments in these places, okay, which eventually led to the, to the imposing different colonial institutions. So think about the classic case would be suitability for sugar, sugar plantations and slavery. And those things maybe were good back in the day only in economic terms, not moral. Not, I'm not talking about like if, if I like or dislike slavery, obviously we're against this institution. But economically, these were very profitable colonies. If you think about Guadalupe, Martinique, eh, Barbados, eh, and obviously Cuba. Eh, but if you fast forward when there is a modern mode of production where ideas matter, then if you have high degrees of inequality, this is actually be going to not uh, help you to grow. So kind of the idea here is the higher inequality you have in the past, the lower levels of growth you're going to have eventually. OK, and the classic examples are going to be one slavery, which we're going to talk quite a bit about in this chapter uh, and two, to think about some countries in the Caribbean. I'm going to show you some evidence here. Uh, but I'll expand uh, when we look at, at the book. OK, so Engerman and Sokolov is going to be our starting point. And then there's going to be different people throughout the continent that have looked not only at the cross country. So why is Canada and the US rich and why is the rest of Latin America poor, but more at the within country level? OK, so here let me just mention perhaps the most famous of these studies, a work by Melissa Dell, also at Harvard. Um, where she looks at the long-term impact of the Mita labor system, and uh, this is in nowadays uh, Peru and Bolivia. Um, this was uh, a colonial institution uh, dating back to the 1500s. And the idea there is that you were forced to give a part of your labor uh, to the colonial, to the colonizers, to the Spanish colonizers. So what she does is that she uses, and here's a bit more technical, a regression discontinuity design, that's a fancy word, just to say, are you inside or outside of this meta boundary? So there's going to be this catchment area. 
And what we find here, or what, what, what she tries to do is, okay, what if I study people that are right inside here versus right outside? And she picks this part because it's gonna have similar altitude, similar geographic characteristics. So kind of the idea here is the only thing that is changing is whether you're part of the meta or not, not other geographic characteristics. Um, and what she finds using this very clever design uh, are negative effects on consumption and higher stunting. So higher stunting is more of a, a term from development economics. Uh, so kids, uh, if they don't eat, they're going to be malnourished. Uh, this is going to make you thinner. But if you don't eat for several years, there's going to be chronic malnutrition and you're also going to be sh shorter. So the height for age measures are lower in these areas that had metas in the past. And uh, she argues that this is in part uh, through a combination of the, the, the fact that there's more haciendas, uh, public goods uh, provision are different, and the sectoral composition of the population uh, and the economy in these places are also different. So this is perhaps the path-breaking uh, study, thinking about how colonial institutions could affect modern outcomes. Uh, it was published in Econometrica in 2010. And let me show you perhaps less known studies, but equally interesting about thinking on colonial institutions. So there is very nice work uh, by Luz Marina Arias and Flores, a uh, very recent work as well on the haciendas and the role of haciendas in Mexico, especially central Mexico. I hope you can see this map. So this will be zooming into Mexico. And the idea here is that Jesuit haciendas uh, had a positive long-term impact um, in uh, central Mexico. There is also work by people uh, like Jean-Paul Faguet, Matajira and Sanchez for encomiendas in Colombia. So I think what, that, what is nice about these papers is that yes, that they're colonial institutions, but it's not only the Mita, it's not only slavery, there are haciendas, uh, there are encomiendas, they also find a positive long-term effect of these encomiendas, which they suggest is going through improved state capacity. Uh, and uh, the, the institution, the very curious uh, feudal institution of concertajes or conciertos in Ecuador. So this is brand new work by Alex Revaleneira. Maybe I'll tell you a little bit more uh, when, because this is one of the chapters for the book, uh, when, when, when we move to that other um, corpus of knowledge of thinking about how these concertajes actually decreased uh, intergenerational uh, income mobility in the case of Ecuador. So yes, there is the meta, but there's been an explosion of studies. That's probably what you're going to see in the book, uh, thinking about what other institutions, what other critical junctures in history, if you want to use that language, uh, have been important to determine the income and the levels of uh, income inequality in our region. Um, so that's still kind of like to motivate things. And the three main arguments that I want to make uh, in, in, this, in this chapter with, with Francisco uh, is A, the role of slavery. So I was showing you before the theory uh, of Engerman and Sokolov. And we take this theory to the data. We take Engerman and Sokolov seriously. And we think about the role of plantations and slavery in Brazil. So that's one of the things, but I, I, I want to show you kind of like cross-country evidence. This is just a, a famous engraving a contemporary, actually, of a rujendas, of a slave market, a slave plantation in Brazil. And this is how slavery looks at the turn of the 18th century in the whole uh, continent, so around the 1750s. Uh, and again, we, 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 it's, it's not a bad idea to start thinking about how potentially like the maps that we saw before and uh, there are parts of the US and especially Brazil and some of the Guyanas uh, that are very uh, much affected by these institutions. So I'm going to show you not only here but also in the in the in the book summary uh, how slavery could be one of these big explanations for underdevelopment and especially for income inequality in the region. Um, so the first test of this theory comes uh, by Nathan Nonne at Harvard at the time, uh, Slavery, Inequality and Income, Testing the Engerman and Sokolov Hypothesis. The title says everything. This, it was published in a book in 2007. And what he finds is that in line with the theory that I just told you, indeed, the more slaves uh, per, per, uh, per capita that you had, so this divided by total population in history, think about Haiti on one extreme, the poorer you are in modern times, okay, 
versus other societies. This is data for the 1750s, such as the United States and Canada and that had less slaves, comparatively at least to countries in the Caribbean, and therefore appear richer. Okay, he also has a nice um, exercise where he only focuses on the Caribbean because obviously it's going to be hard to compare the US and Canada with smaller countries, uh, island uh, economies such as Haiti. And then, but forget about that, you can also do the same exercise for within the US. This is the relationship between slavery in 1860s, so much later, one century later, uh, and now we're at the brink of uh, the Civil War, which obviously was also fought on slavery grounds. And you can see how more slavery in history is associated with higher income inequality. Okay, and this is nice because we are not thinking about cross-country differences. This is within the US, still at the state level. So maybe we only have 50 observations as opposed to the other countries in the Americas, but it's, it's a step forward. And then this type of evidence can be exploited even further if you think about the US. So I, just, I was just making the point that some of this evidence that we saw at the state level, we can also see at the county level. Okay, so now it's data for more than 3,000 counties in the US. Uh, so this is the relationship between slavery and total population and modern income is less, uh, it's a bit more subtle than before in terms of income inequality, sorry for income, but it's very pronounced in terms of inequality uh, of income. So the second order of the distribution, the second moment, so kind of like back to the state level, it's something that we can also reproduce at the county level. There's a nice work by Bertocchi and D'Amico that is also linking this to human capital still very much uh, for the US. And what we do with Bill Maloney, which is one of the articles that I'm gonna uh, get back to at the end, uh, is that we also run these types of regression. So this is now sub-national level data for the Americas, so state level, but not only for the US, but for the rest of the continent. And we also observe a strong positive raw correlation, so no controls econometrically between the percentage of slaves um, early on as a colonial institution for the Americas and the Gini coefficient, which is uh, our, one of the classic measures for income inequality. It's a measure that goes from zero to one, zero very low inequality, one very high inequality. And here the same thing happens if you include geographic and weather characteristics, there's still a positive and significant correlation from historical slavery to modern inequality. What these papers don't do is to go like the final step and think about identification. So for that, I'm gonna take you mostly to Brazil and why Brazil? If you just take the Yale uh, Transatlantic Slave Project, you see that the flows of slavery to Brazil dwarf any other slavery flows to the region. They're larger than the Caribbean flows. They're four times larger than the number of slaves that go to the United States. And obviously they're much lighter, larger than the number of slaves going to other areas in South America, such as Cartagena and Rio de la Plata at the time. So if you wanna think about slavery, uh, our uh, work with Umberto Laudares or our response with Umberto Laudares is that maybe it's a good idea to think about colonial Brazil. Um, and the idea here is to go back to colonial history and uh, think about the Treaty of Tordesillas, which is a dividing line between the east and the west of this meridian here, which corresponds to this 46.7 degrees that you see on the right. And the idea is that part of the country was colonized by Portuguese, the other part of what today would be Brazil was colonized by, by the Spaniards, and how this differential in the colonial origins of who colonized you, given the comparative advantage of the Portuguese had in slave trading, is going to serve as a shock to identify the effect of slavery. So back to some of these regression discontinuity designs that I just showed you for the Mita in the case of Peru and Bolivia now taken to the Brazilian uh, country. So here is kind of like the, the nutshell of, of the argument. We conduct a donut regression discontinuity design, which is just fancy terms for saying, we're gonna look at whether there is a discontinuity, a jump, between the number of slaves over total population, this is in historical times, we use census data for 1872, and you see that indeed there is a significant jump in this measure. And then we look at modern income inequality, this is measured uh, using data for the 2000s, and we observe that 
this continuity as well. So if we, when we think about the Engerman and Sokolov hypothesis of some colonial institution affecting modern outcomes, I think this is exactly what they had in mind. So this is yet again an empirical identified, econometrically identified test of the Engerman and Sokolov hypothesis. I guess the natural question is to think, well, but what about income, which would be kind of like the next part? Um, and there we actually don't find much. I mean, if anything, GDP per capita in modern times is slightly higher, but highly insignificant. So if anything, kind of stable. So there is not much change in income, at least for this same discontinuity in the case of Brazil. But the minute that you start thinking about income racial imbalances, so here is a simple measure of that, just the income of blacks, the average income of blacks over the average income of whites, so Afro-Brazilians versus the white population in Brazil, you see that jump. Okay, so this paper is saying slavery has an impact on inequality, not much in terms of income, but in terms of decompositions of income, especially when we think on racial grounds, like racial gaps, racial income inequality, the jumps are massive. And then the rest of the paper, which I'm not gonna give you all of the details, you're happy to, to, to share that also, the links uh, here in, in the course, or, or you can look at my website, uh, is to think about what are the channels of transmission, and that's where things like education are gonna be important. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about education later on in the talk. Um, there is similar work, for instance, by Darren Asemoglu and co-authors uh, for the case of Colombia, where they look at the municipal level that higher uh, slave concentration also leads to lower GDP per capita uh, in, the, in, the, in the Colombian case. Uh, and what they use in terms of instrumentation, this is another uh, econometric te technique where you need to find an instrument that shocks, in this case, the, in the slavery variable, but not the long-term variable. It's only working through slavery, and they use exhausted mines. So slaves were taken to mines, these mines are over, and now these areas that have more mines, I mean, if in the case of Colombia, if you're familiar, probably the coast of Chocó would, would, would stand out at you, and that is very high in terms of former colonial slavery. It's also one of the poorest departments, as you can see here, uh, the case of Chocó uh, in Colombia. Whereas places that had less slavery, think about Santander or Bogotá itself, uh, are richer today. Okay, so this is just to say that there is evidence for other countries that kind of complements what I just showed you for Brazil and for the US. Um, the second big topic that I wanted to talk to you about is land and land reform. Big topic, highly controversial, so I want to kind of like show you what the literature has done here. Uh, this is a measure of the land genie. Before we saw the income genie, and uh, now we can think about the same measure, but in terms of land and land concentration. And here is where I told you that, that Chile is one of the uh, champions in terms of land inequality in the, in the continent or in the subcontinent. There is work, uh, for instance, by the same Melissa Dell that I showed you before for the Mita on the Mexican Revolution and land redistribution. So it's an argument of path dependence in long-term development. There is more recent work that I'm going to show you in the chapter by Eduardo Montero on cooperatives and property rights in El Salvador. So let me focus on, on that on that paper in the in the book chapter uh, in the book. Sorry, in his in his chapter for the book. Um, there is very interesting work by, by Albertus, from, also from the University of Chicago, uh, where he shows that land reform reduced conflict in Peru. So some areas that had more successful land reforms are areas that are hit less hard uh, when the Shining Path, the Sendero Luminoso guerrillas, uh, are um, active uh, later on in time. Uh, and, but he also finds an interesting result, which is that land reform decreased human capital acquisition in Peru uh, by lowering demand because most of these people are now going to stay in the agriculture as opposed to the manufacturing se uh, sector. So land is interesting, uh, but it's, it's, it, it's a bit problematic. I think Argelia is raising her hand. Argelia, do you want to say something? Okay, I'm going to continue, but Fernando, like, please see if maybe there is still some problems with the translation. Or Argelia, just feel free to to let us yeah, know. No. Okay. Yeah, let's go. Okay, the second part of, of this land reform literature, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice book, but an interesting food for thought. Marcus Albertus also tells us 
that autocracy, autocratic regimes have the ones that re have distributed most land in Latin America. So we think that land reform is more of a democratic, uh, maybe even leftist agenda. And it turns out that it has been dictators or autocrats in the region that have distributed the most land in Latin America. So that's, that's a very controversial and interesting book, Food for Thought. Uh, more specific case studies, uh, Juan Sebastián Galán has a nice paper showing that land reform uh, improved intergenerational income mobility in the case of Colombia. And also for Colombia, Maria del Pilar López Uribe has work showing that land reform was used as a strategic political cho choice uh, by the elites to co-opt uh, the peasant elites of the land reform movement, especially one called the ANUC. Uh, in terms of, of land reform in Chile, I just showed you that it's one of the big champions in terms of land uh, inequality. So Nicolás Lilo Bustos has very interesting work on land redistribution and crop choice. Uh, and, in, and, in Mex and in Chile, it's interesting because you have reform uh, on their agenda and then counter reform. So the, the, the stopping the land reform uh, under Pinochet in Chile. I'm also going to talk more about Pinochet in the, in the book. Uh, Jaimovic and Toledo. Uh, Think about the failed land reform uh, and conflict with the Mapuches and the Araucanía region uh, in the case of Chile. And some of these lessons are also there in the US and in other countries in Europe, such as Italy, uh, um, France and Germany. Some other studies that maybe I'm going to skip in the interest of time. And um, the third big topic that emerges from this chapter is education. So this is one of the pillars, one of the main assets when we think about development, when we think about growth, education is at the cornerstone. And in terms of inequality, it's also very important. We find that countries that were more educated back in time, think about, again, the US and Canada, they are less unequal today. So, and this is just a simple correlation. You have more education, these countries are less unequal, whereas countries that fare particularly badly in terms of education, think about Brazil, uh, are highly unequal today. Again, Colombia uh, could also be one of these examples. And um, so we revisit some of this literature and um, there is work, for instance, thinking about the provision of education, uh, again, by Asemoglu and co-authors in the case of Cundinamarca, which is a state in Colombia. And what they show is that it's not only the role of economic inequality, because if anything, in some cases, this could be positively associated uh, with schooling, but also the role of political inequality. So also in the book, I'm going to give you a little bit more on the political angle. So not only what economists and economic historians have thought, uh, but also what political scientists and political economists have thought about this topic. So this is a, a small study, but a, a very influential one, thinking about the role of e economic and political inequality. And I have uh, work on, uh, on missions and, uh, and, high, and the accumulation of human capital in the case of Paraguay. This was published in 2019. And there, what, what I find, like this is just like a, a summary table, is that places that are closer to a Jesuit mission have better uh, literacy. So if the ones that are farther away would have more illiteracy. That's what the table is saying. Uh, but also, if you think about uh, income, the farther away that you are from a Jesuit mission, the poorer that you are. And this would be in modern day, so the, the old Paraguay, so modern day Paraguay, Argentina and Brazil, uh, but also in terms of inequality. So the farther away you're from one of these Jesuit missions, uh, the more unequal you are and same thing in terms of health. And so that's kind of like thinking about missions and other colonial institution, uh, uh, in this case, in the, in the case of Paraguay. And we have work also with Bill Maloney on the role of engineers and innovation. Here we're just giving it the inequality twist. So not much in terms of the of early uh, investments in very high human capital. These would be engineers in the United States at the turn of the second industrial revolution. Not much effect there. But if you think about patents, areas where there is more patents filed, filed historically are also areas that have more inequality. This would be at the county level in the US. So that's why you see that we can take a million controls, things like even state fixed effects, so that the effects are concentrated, for instance, within Texas or within California, instead of having to compare across states.
uh, and we use as an instrument against something that shocks the, in this case, the engineering variable, but not the income variable or the inequality variable. And what we show, show here is that the distance to the Langwin College, the farther away you are, the more unequal the society is. And again, I invite you uh, in the interest of time uh, to maybe look at some of these papers or happy to send you the links or to look at my webpage for work on the, on the early missionaries and the more modern land grant colleges and engineering in the US. Um, so other topics that 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 are interesting in, in when we think about um, in income inequality, uh, I alluded to the role of political power. So there's beautiful work by Javier Mejia also for the book. So maybe I'm gonna just give you a sense of what he's uh, doing here in terms of the interconnectedness of bankers and manufacturers. That's the beautiful uh, chart that you see on the right. And this is a topic that has been studied by people uh, like Hirschman, uh, who, thought, who, who taught us that we should think about the three big development poles in Latin America being Medellin, Sao Paulo, and Monterrey, uh, and a historical work by Antwinem, uh, miners and merchants in the, in the making of modern Colombia. Uh, so he's taking these classic questions and applying very uh, modern techniques. Uh, similar summaries, I'm going to talk more about this, uh, a chapter by Ferguson and Vargas for the book, and a chapter by Dorothy Kronick and Francisco Rodriguez, who's also one of the panelists of the course uh, in the case of Venezuela. So elites might be something to think about when we think about inequality. Uh, health inequality, there is very interesting uh, brand new work by John Denton Schneider at Clark University and Eduardo Montero that I've mentioned before. Uh, for University of Chicago, the Harris School, uh, thinking about health disparities in the context of Chagas disease. This is a disease that mostly affects uh, tropical Latin America, uh, especially Colombia and Brazil. Uh, so areas where Chagas disease was eradicated uh, see uh, big improvements in the racial gaps that I was telling you about before, especially between African uh, Afro-Brazilians uh, and white Brazilians. Uh, we, if we think about inequality, it's important to think about wage dispersion. So who is it that is earning more or less? And there is very nice work kind of like tracking the evolution of wage dispersion in Latin America for 100 years uh, for these selected six countries, Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Venezuela. And what you see is that, I mean, even though this was fairly concentrated at the beginning of the time period, uh, it's had, it has exploded almost everyone, perhaps with the exception of his own home country of Venezuela. Okay, and the last thing that I wanted to do in the context of this chapter um, is to think about extensions and replications of classic studies. So the probably the most famous is going to be Asimoglu, Johnson and Robinson. I'm going to show you in one second in the next slide. Um, but instead of thinking about income, thinking about inequality and, and what do we learn there? And then going subnationally for the uh, whole of the Americas uh, using data by Brun and Gallego, another famous study published at Restud in 2012, uh, a famous study on migration by uh, Claudio Ferraz, Rudy Rocha, and Rodrigo Soares, published in the AJ Applied. Uh, and our own work, I guess if we want to be critical, uh, we are also going to be uh, self-critical here uh, about uh, uh, this is published work with uh, Bill Maloney on the Economic Journal, um, not only thinking about pre-colonial population density, but also thinking about slavery. So very simple exercise. We're just taking the famous papers, in this case, probably the most famous, Asimoglu, Johnson and Robinson, AER 2001, the original figure shows the negative relationship between settler mortality. So the higher the probability that the European settlers are going to die, the lower the institutions and the lower the GDP. And that's what you say, see here, kind of comparing Nigeria, let's say, with Australia. OK, that's in terms of income. In terms of the Gini coefficient, our favorite measure for, for income inequality, we don't see much. Okay, and this is not a criticism of their paper. This is just like a new uh, re uh, result or an extension, which is to say maybe the same things or variables that are shocking income might not be the same variables that are shocking inequality. And I think that that's that's an important lesson, and it's an important lesson because it takes us back to Kuznets and this older idea, obviously a Nobel Prize winner, writing in the fifties of. At the very beginning, if you're very poor, think about Ethiopia, it's going to be hard to be unequal just because everyone's so poor that inequality is going to be low. 
if you take a very rich society like think Sweden and everyone's more or less rich, inequality is not going to be very high. OK, but it's in the intermediate levels of development. So I guess Bolivia and South Africa stand out here where some sectors are modern. Some people are very rich because of that and others might still be close to the poverty line. OK, so when we think about the relationship between income and inequality is not as simple as one thinks, it's not only like a positive or negative straight line. But there is this inverse U that could be interesting and important to think about. And again, I'm happy to discuss these uh, ideas in the Q&A. And um, the rest is kind of replicating the same idea. Uh, we take this famous study uh, by uh, Brun and Pancho Gallego at Restat. And uh, they divide the world uh, for the Americas into good, bad and ugly activities. And they have very significant and, and strong effects. Once you start looking at inequality in terms of in, instead of income, there's some of these effects, but at the, at the end of the day, they disappear once you add control. So not much robustness there. Again, not a criticism of their paper, but just thinking about what's the difference between income and inequality. Uh, same thing for Claudius and co-authors paper on immigration and, and income in Brazil, very strong effects for human capital and income persistence. Uh, given the early uh, settlements of Sao Paulo, this was a state-sponsored migration program. I'm going to tell you a bit more about those in, in, the, in the book as well. Uh, no effect in terms of income inequality as opposed to, to income, so our, our, our Gini coefficient measure. Uh, and even in our own work with Bill Maloney, where we find a very strong effect of pre-colonial population density. We published this in the Economic Journal in 2016. Also happy to share the link or just look at my webpage page to, to download it. And, and that was a very strong effect in income. Once we look at income distribution, there is really not much there. And so again, how it's different to look at income and income inequality. Uh, but once we look at slavery, back to what we learned before, uh, there is a strong uh, effect on current income. So having more slaves is going to depress income. And this is a panel of countries. So this would be Colombia, Brazil, and the US, again, at the subnational level. And also interesting results in terms of uh, income inequality. Obviously, the sample is a bit small. Uh, but in some cases, we observe uh, that more slavery is increasing income inequality back in. Uh, so income inequality in modern times from slavery back then, uh, though it's not super significant once you add other sets of control. So this goes back to thinking about is this slavery or this is more the conditions for slavery in terms of the Engerman and, and Sokolov world. And, and to conclude uh, this part, so that you're also thinking about potential comments and questions in, in, the, in the next few minutes, um, in this chapter, we look at the historical roots of Latin America's high levels of inequality. We stress the colonial origins uh, and we think about factor endowments, the work of Engerman and Sokolov, more than the post-independence factors. So it's not saying that these are not important, not relevant. Of course, trade is important. Of course, trade might have exacerbated some of these channels and uh, uh, of persistence, but we mostly center on the colonial um, story, where slavery is a key determinant for both income and inequality in the region. Uh, we look at the central role of land and land redistribution, which is a complicated topic, so we saw some interesting results there. Uh, and obviously the role of education, which is also a transversal topic that is affecting slavery, it's affecting land reform, and obviously has a, an effect of its own through education itself. Uh, and at the end, we look at empirical replications, where if anything, we learn how hard it is to shock uh, the inequality variable historically. Uh, when, once we are using some of the common proxies in the literature, think about settler mortality, things like migration, and even our own work with Bill Maloney. Um, and I guess what maybe one thing to ponder about also for the book, and it's a nice segue for the book, of course, I prepared these slides on purpose uh, for that, is to think about the role of policy in a quote unquote deep rooted world, deep rooted continent where history matters. Okay, so we're probably going to have a few minutes or at least a few seconds uh, to think about some of these issues uh, while I change slides so happy to maybe take comments or questions if they are in the in the chat uh, fernando please let yes. me know 
um, just as I change um, to the to the book. Yes, thank you, Felipe. So this is kind of just a mid pause between the presentations. I guess one 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 set of questions that have been created in the in the Q and A is about the trade off between inequality and income. So how is your perspective about that? Big topic, and I think that my perspective uh, is very much. Um, I mean, there, there's several things to say there. I think that we observe Kuznets in the cross section. So this idea of low levels of development, low inequality, as you become a middle income economy, you're developing the secondary and the tertiary sectors, you see more inequality, and eventually you also see lower levels of inequality once the, the country is fully developed. Uh, but for instance, if you look at the work of Piketty, the U.S. is getting richer, but it's also becoming more unequal. So over time for a given country, Kuznets breaks down. Uh, and I think it calls for a more active role for policy and redistribution, especially in a country as unequal as ours. Of course, there are trade-offs. OK, so I mean, I, I guess the, the, the question uh, might it's probably coming from someone that is already thinking about these important trade-offs, it's economics at the end of the day. So how can you redistribute without decreasing efficiency? Let me just give you uh, 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 something that perhaps you didn't know. Uh, the pre-tax income Gini in France is not very different to the pre-tax income Gini in their average median Latin American country. Where we are really bad, is in redistribution. So once Fra France gets all of these taxes and is giving more to the poor, it's giving less to the rich, it becomes more uh, equal. In the case of Latin America, if you think about pensions, if you think about tertiary education, if anything, it's not that the state is decreasing inequality, is that sometimes it's even helping to increase inequality, okay? Uh, but that's just one tentative answer. Happy to like discuss at further length at the end if there's time. Uh, and highly encourage you uh, to look at the project of La Cid. Uh, this is through LSE Inequalities, uh, UCL, University College of London, uh, Yale, and the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, they have their own webpage. And soon uh, they're going to be posting not only our chapter, but the other 30 chapters that look exactly at these topics. What is the trade-off with efficiency? How do you actually redistribute? How important is our fiscal uh, apparatus in the region, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. So is that okay for now, Fernando? Are there other yes. questions? Okay. No, yes, we can move on to the second part of the presentation. Thank you. Okay. So I mentioned maybe too much um, the book, but I'm obviously very excited about this book launch. Uh, I think it's the first time that, that, that it's gonna be uh, the whole book together. And so, so, so you're guinea pigs in this experiment, but you also have the privilege of, of seeing a lot of interesting work that I had to read and edit for the last few years. And the title is Roots of Underdevelopment, a, a New Economic and Political History of Latin America and the Caribbean. So if the past exercise was about closing or, or, or focusing and going deeper and deeper and deeper, I want you to think about this exercise as opening up okay so i'm gonna give you a tour of the rich and breadth and depth of research or much or very modern research like literally it's, it's gonna be printed perhaps this year 2023 research in latin america to perhaps inspire you so instead of saying like oh but there's no chapter for cuba why don't you write the chapter for cuba okay so i want to show you what's out there in a very selected way. I mean, it has 20 chapters, but still, I mean, 20 chapters is not enough to cover Latin America. Um, and maybe, as I was alluded to at the end, uh, inspire you to do your own work in the region. So just show you the breadth and richness of the Latin America historical experience, which you've been seeing uh, throughout this, this course. So this is a table of contents. I'm not going to spend too much time here. Just there's going to be one introduction by myself, a conclusion by Alberto Diaz Calleros, who's the 
uh, chair of uh, Latin American Studies um, and Center uh, at Stanford, uh, and 18 chapters, one more general for the Latin American region as a whole, uh, and then 17 others on 16 different uh, countries. Uh, Colombia is repeated, uh, and I guess Puerto Rico, we can debate if it's a country or not, uh, so one uh, U.S. territory. Okay, so the introduction, which was uh, written by myself, uh, it's historical development in Latin America, uh, very much inspired by the uh, book that I told you before, where the Engerman and Sokolov article comes up, uh, about. And uh, this is uh, how Latin American fell behind. It's a book by Steve Haber. It's edited in two volumes in 1997, the classic one that I told you before, and a new one in the 2000s. And the work by my now colleague Nathan Nunn at the University of British Columbia, back then at Harvard, summarizing the literature in 2009 and nine uh, in, uh, in the NBR annual, 2004 uh, uh, in a handbook chapter, and 2020 uh, in science. Um, uh, summaries by uh, Wax Yarg and Roman, um, thinking about the same topics in the JL, Journal of Economic Literature, an ebook by Stelios and Elias, uh, uh, edited by CPR, uh, and a very, uh, very recent contribution where I uh, also have a chapter on methods uh, by Alberto Vicin and Giovanni Federico called Historical Economics. So, motivated by this literature, we wanted to do kind of the same for Latin America. Um, so you're going to see that the book has many different topics, but it's unified in terms of method methodology. So it's empirical. We care about data. So hence, we're following the cleometric revolution that I mentioned before in economic history in the U.S. Uh, we try to think about causality and identification. So that's actually the chapter that I have in the Bicin and Federico handbook on IVs and RDDs in economic history. Happy to share that with you or just go to my uh, webpage to, to download it, uh, along with theoretical models. For instance, we're going to see the chapter by, by uh, Fernando uh, uh, here in the, in the panel. It's, it's more theoretical. Think about mechanisms of transmission, which is like the new thing in terms of persistent studies. There's a very nice chapter by Joaquin Vod in the same handbook by Alberto and Giovanni. Um, and uh, a restart uh, article of Non and Giuliano thinking about not only is there persistence, yes or no, but when is there persistence and what are some of like the, the things to, to think about. So this is crucial to think about the specific phenomenon analyzed. Uh, but I think also to make segues into policy and tell something more productive to policymakers. Uh, even though you're going to see kind of like an explosion of different topics, uh, there are going to be some main ones. Some of them we've already seen migration, slavery, colonial institutions, elite and land tenure uh, and many, many others. So, so I think that there was a trade off between having as many countries and authors as possible and trying to, to keep some narrative thread. Uh, but I think that the thread line in this book, again, is this methodological uh, union. And at the end, in the conclusion, we're going to go back to what are some of the key topics that, that we get from the book. So the first chapter is by Luis Bertola, a very famous Uruguayan economic historian, uh, and Jose Antonio Campo, same thing, and also the current finance minister of Colombia. And they wrote what I view as the last uh, big main economic history of the region. So that's Bertolano Campo, 2012. And they look at the process of Latin American economic development, mostly through the lenses of trade fluctuations. So things like terms of trade uh, and how that affects long term GDP growth or the lack thereof. Here we see that Latin America has a share of the GDP of the world. Uh, it's never more than 10%, and if anything, has decreased quite recently. So it's a, it's a region that is shrinking, or at least that it's not growing as much as the rest of the world. And how a series of boom and bust cycles, think about the rubber boom, things that you've also seen already in class, uh, like the guano boom, uh, have been important in determining the income or underdevelopment of the region, uh, obviously, the main one being oil. So you see here the terms of trade for oil and non-oil exports over time. OK, so this economic volatility, and this is important in this third chapter, is not only generating kind of a financial economic phenomenon, 
but it's spreading social and political crisis throughout the region. So it's not only an economic uh, argument, but it's also very much a political and a social uh, argument. Uh, if you think about economic inequality, as we devoted the last half an hour, 45 minutes, thinking about uh, and poverty, um, there were some improvements uh, in the very end of the 1900s, if you think about uh, equity and poverty, uh, but again, kind of like we have COVID-19 and kind of like back to square zero. And uh, so what uh, this is what I was telling you before that Jose Antonio thinks about a new lost decade for the continent. Uh, and they also talk about kind of like more traditional topics, so, such as international crisis, whether there was an external currency crisis, banking crisis, dual crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So this is like a very nice panoramic view of the region uh, that ties us to like that more traditional approach of thinking about economic history in Latin America, mostly uh, summarizing their book, their 2012 contribution, okay? We think a little bit differently um, in the rest of the book of going country by country. So here's a, a, a chapter by Fernando. I don't know if Fernando, if you, if you want to present it, uh, you, you can go ahead and, and present it. Uh, so he thinks about uh, New Spain, so modern day Mexico as one of the two main Spanish colonial centers, the other one being Lima in Peru, which I'm going to tell you in a second. And the idea is, how do we think about state formation over time? Okay, so over time, literally, he goes back to the very beginning of colonization. So how do you become a state? Okay, so nowadays we think about Mexico and Colombia, but how does this concept even come about? Okay, and so you have as a, as a very nice uh, theoretical model, uh, and he thinks about two key, key moments in time. One is the conquest of Mesoamerica, at the very beginning, Hernán Cortés and, and companies so of 1518 to 1535. And the second one is the independence of Mexico as a republic, so uh, all the way to the 18, uh, 1810s. And as you see, the, the, there is a super long history of colonialism in Latin America. This is different for Africa, uh, where in some cases it starts in the 1880s and it lasts until the 1960s. So there is early independence, or, sorry, late independence. But in the case of Latin America, we had hundreds of years of colonization. So we can think about like these critical junctures. That's what Fernando does and see how those affect modern day Mexico. Uh, so more in, in more specifically, uh, he thinks about the creation and the implosion of the Spanish state. And uh, so the framework is very much uh, motivated by historical political economy. So there is a decentralization slash rent extraction framework. So Remember, this is an empire, so the Spaniards want to take as much as possible. Uh, and the argument here is that there is a co-opting of the an, an adaptation of the existing pre-Columbian institutions. So just as before, we had the Incas and the Mita. Here we also have the Aztecs and the Mayas. So by co-opting and working with the local authorities is that the Spaniards are able to take the most. So this is not a humanitarian thing that they just like the Aztecs or dislike the Olmecs. This is about how do you grab power and how do you use the existing hierarchy, hierarchies uh, and the existing uh, social infrastructure, taxing infrastructure, labor infrastructure, uh, and how do you use that in your favor? Uh, and obviously, uh, this, this is kind of the same uh, logic can be used to think about uh, centralization as a backlash and to the to the Spanish centralization uh, reforms, mostly the Bourbon reforms, and how where you try to centralize the empire, there's going to be a backlash in terms of independence in Mexico. And uh, so I, I guess Fernando didn't comment. I, I hope he's happy with his summary. But yeah, you did quite better than me. Okay, <laughs> you need to jump in at any time. Um, the other big center of colonial power in the region uh, is Peru. Um, this is work by Jenny Guardado at Georgetown, mostly coming from political science. So it's a book that tries to also incorporate what the policy uh, world and political economists are thinking. Uh, and she thinks about checks and balances again in the colonial government, in this case of Peru, the other big vice royalty uh, in, in Latin America, uh, focusing on corregidores. So these are local colonial governors during the 18th century. She centers in the period 
from 1687 to 1751. It sounds a bit uh, specific, but this is kind of like the, the core right before the Bourbon period and the Bourbon reforms in the 1750s. If you think about trade liberalization, if you think about uh, intendancy reform, something that we're also working on uh, along with co-authors. And what she thinks is that these checks and balances, I'm gonna show you in a second the specific institutions in the late 17th century, change the value of office. So these, you could buy these corregimientos, but then how much oversight there is. So nowadays we think again about like a, a modern judiciary sector. Back then, it's not that clear. So if you pay for office, what you pay for office is going to depend on how many people you have in terms of oversight over you. Uh, so that what she thinks here is that there's going to be a system of audiencias and tribunales de cuentas. This would be the oversight uh, bodies. So depending on how much oversight there is, you might want to pay or not for this office of the corregidores. And there's a whole interplay, for instance, with the church, where I'm also going to tell you a little bit more about missions in a second, but also other landed elites. And we're going to also talk, talk about elites. And obviously, like the system of fiscal and uh, distribution and redistribution in the empire through these cajas reales. So the role of audiencias and population density is going to affect the most how much you pay for office, which is the big brunt of her work. And what she says is that having this set of overlapping jurisdictions uh, in a way proved uh, an effective constraint uh, to local corruption by these corregidores. The work of, uh, of, of concertajes for Ecuador, we talked about before, but here let me expand. This is by Alex Rivadeneira from the Bank of Mexico, uh, attached one, attached forever. Um, so these conciertos, uh, it's another labor institution, very much like the Mita, where you were tied to the land as an indigenous person. So this is a colonial level labor institution. He's contributing with the new archival work of what are the tax records, where were these conciertos, what were the types of contracts. Uh, and if you want to think about it in, in other terms, this is uh, one example of that peonage. So where you're tied to the land, uh, in this case on these haciendas. So he finds that where there's more of these conciertos, 10% increase in concertaje, decreases income, modern day income by 5%. And this again, back to the, to the chapter that we just touched upon before, it's mostly working through education. So what he does in terms of identification is to exploit the relative intensity of, of labor requirements. This again is an uh, instrumental variable strategies. Uh, so think about Angerman and Sokolov. So what is the soil suitability? And how is those? How are those things affecting the colonial institutions that you can have, which shows you that areas that have more corsertaje are going to have less income. So this is the partial, um, uh, the partial result that I showed you before. And again, the idea is that you're going to be tied to the land. Hence the chapter of the paper in the agricultural sector. You're going to have less years of schooling, less spending on public goods. Uh, and I think what's really nice and what he's working on nowadays uh, is to extend this also at the individual level. So all of those chapters are very much colonial. Uh, what Jose Perez uh, Cajillas from uh, Universidad de Barcelona uh, in economic history does is to think about ethnicity, ethnic fractionalization and public good provision. This is a classic topic if you think about the work of Alessina and Eliana La Ferrara, um, but it has not been studied very much for Latin America as opposed to Africa. So he thinks about how an educational reforms that took place in Bolivia during the first half of the 20th century, mostly in the 1950s, uh, whether they have some effect, but not a general effect. And I think that this is what's nice of this chapter, but a individual effect that could be regional. So here you see like big differences you can think that Bolivia is poor, Bolivia is middle income, but big differences for the different states and departments. If you think about La, La Paz versus Potosí, again, Potosí was important in the in the Mita uh, study. So he uses this micro data from the 1976 uh, census to quantify the evolution of literacy rates at the department level. And more importantly, to think about racial, in this case, ethnic terms. So how are the different ethnic groups, in this case, predominantly the Quechos and the Aymaras? Here's just a map of Bolivian literacy by province in the 1940s. So you see important heterogeneous 
uh, heterogeneity variation across the, the, the country. So how these different reforms are going to affect not only you by state, but also by race. So we say, oh, this reform was good or bad, but we don't spend too much time in thinking, well, is this good for Potosí versus Oruro, or is this good not for indigenous people, but maybe for Quechuas versus Aymara. So he finds a large degree of heterogeneity, which he also extends to the gender dimension. So not only about being a Quechua in Oruro, but it's different if you're a male or a female. So lots of richness in this study. Um, in their chapter for Argentina, and this is something that we're also going to see for, for Brazil, so again, departing from the colonial experience, Federico Droller, Martin Fishben, and Santiago Perez, some of the experts of migration in Latin America, uh, look at the age of mass migration in Argentina, uh, focusing on social mobility. So the idea here is that, I mean, Argentina was the second largest destination country for international migrants during the age of mass migration. Think about the work of Lea Bustan and Rana Barmitsky for the U.S. So they want to do this for Latin America. It received six million immigrants during this period. So you can see here the explosion of migrants. And they try to think about how did this come about? What is the long term assimilation of these people? I mean, it's a huge inflow of migrants and whether that increased, quote unquote, development or not in the long term, that turns to be the case. So they showed that these Europeans experience very rapid upward mobility. Here's a nice comparison of the literacy rate. So were these people selected or not in Argentina versus the US? If anything, a bit better selected in the US than in Argentina. But anyways, these migrants have much higher literacy rates than in the home country, right? So the, the gap between Argentina and even Italy is higher than the gap between the US and these other countries that would have more literacy like Sweden and England, but for Argentina, most of them have higher literacy, okay? So how this higher literacy influx of people has, is very large, especially for Italians. This is the, the, the largest uh, group during this time period and how even these Italians, which that might be positively selected relative to Argentina and even relative to Italy itself, are experiencing the highest up, uh, increases in mobility and eventually contributing to longer term growth. Um, there is similar work by uh, Aldo Musacchio and co-authors, Andre Lanza and Manas Maniar, uh, of a program of state-sponsored migration in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, another key topic and, and, and key region for attracting European migrants. Uh, they look from 1882 to 1920, and they document how this program, which is a state-sponsored migration, in a way sends people a bit randomly. So they exploit the random assignment of, of, of migrants to look at the short uh, term um, uh, impact that they might have had. So imagine that you arrive to this office in Sao Paulo and you, you're sent to different parts of the state. Here we can see uh, the, the regional distribution. So there's gonna be more or less intensity of migration over time uh, in this region. And what they show is they link this European migration to technology adoption. So there's going to be higher farm output, higher adoption of specific technologies such as plows, harrows, cultivators, and tractors because of these European migrants. So very positive views of migration in Argentina and Brazil. And in terms of elites, remember that study that I briefly mentioned by Javier Mejia at Stanford University, thinking about modernizing elites in Latin America and using this very modern social network and a approach, for instance, by people like Matt Jackson, one of his supervisors, on the emergence of banking in Antioquia. So a specific state, one of the poles of development of Hirschman that I mentioned before. So how do you reconcile individual entrepreneurs? So we think about Elon Musk and Steve Jobs with this more collective behavior. So what are the links of these people? So what are the key interactions to be precise here between bankers and the economic elites? Something that's important in Antioquia up to today. And so he looks in the 19th and 20th century, contributing with brand new data. So kind of like fresh perspective to an old program problem. And he can tie different commercial houses to banks, okay? so. Whereas the banker in the network is going to matter for the further economic per per performance, these bankers are diverse, 
and eventually they're going to intermarry with some of the industrial and manufacturing elite. So there is persistence and non-persistence because like there's a dynamic uh, role of changing elites over time that the end at the end are not so separate but are amalgamating themselves. And this thinking about elites is also there in the other chapter by Leopoldo Ferguson and Juan Fernando Vargas, some of the preeminent political economists and uh, conflict experts in the country. So there is this important paradox of Colombia why do you have violence in a country that is a remarkably stable democracy? So how do we think about democracy and conflict? And they argue that there are different factors. So one could be the horizontal nature of conflict. So again, thinking about not only like are there the rich and poor, but there could be intra elite competition. This is going to be very clear in the next chapter for Venezuela and that there has been weak oversight institutions such as the judiciary and even the military to try to control or constrain some of these behaviors so not very different from what jenny argues for peru as we just saw in colonial times they zoom into the 1853 constitution of the democratization effort so what you see is that there is a slight decrease in violence i should have put a title here uh, but that this violence like goes back to uh, square one and um, so they have very new and uh, novel data on political violence confrontations so yes there's a temporary drop but then these constitutional democratic reforms are not enough to give kind of like real like a real redistribution of power that could calm down violence at least in the 1850s in colombia and as i was just mentioning this is very similar to what dorothy chronic uh, and Francisco Rodriguez, uh, he's one of the panelists of this course, a uh, find for Venezuela. So political conflict and economic growth in post-independence Venezuela. They look at three main economic crises, which I think are very hard to see in, in these slides, but there's one big one here, like uh, up until the 1870s, and there's three main ones, which they study here from the Agus Madison uh, project in the 70s and obviously uh, during Chavez um, and they say like look there is of course a role of oil and resource dependence I'm going to show that in the in the next graph but there is also an important intra-class conflict so it's not only the rich and poor it's how these elites thinks about think about the liberales and the conservadores in Colombia in the case of Colombia back in Leopoldo's and Juan Fernando's chapter but more about the same thing in Venezuela so how the kind of the worst policies are just the elites fighting each other um, and maybe the, the best case to see this is the collapse of oil production so obviously venezuela is one of the biggest oil producers in the world a big boom in the 70s and you can see kind of like the rise and fall of this commodity over the century and here i'm zooming into what happens during the uh, latest uh, chavez collapse uh, and again, there is kind of this idea of like there is potential institutional framework, but there are also institutions that were not able to mediate this intra elite conflict successfully. OK, so the uh, authors argue that the catastrophe could have been avoided. Here's the chapter for Suriname, which I think it's 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 I mean, the, these countries are in the region. Uh, we barely hear about them. They don't play football with us, uh, so that's a, a big thing. And um, here's work actually by a team of Dutch uh, economic historians, Abde Young, uh, Tim Koishmans, and Peter Kudjis. Um, and they think about very similar things, like when we think about Brazil that I just showed you in the, in the other presentation, uh, when we think about slavery in uh, Suriname by these Dutch colonizers, so the Dutch might be different from the Portuguese, but at the end of the day, there were slaveholders and Suriname is different from Brazil, but at the end of the day, they were establishing these plantations. So they reviewed the literature, interestingly, not only in English, but also their Dutch sources and conduct a, a very interesting archival work on this Van der Poel uh, and Lever and the Bruyne banks. Um, and they find that these plantations, I mean, you cannot have plantation without financing. And there was a lot of financing coming from these Amsterdam bank intermediaries especially the role of these negotiates. So this would be kind of like syndicate loans. So you won't go directly and invest in a plantation. So there's kind of like financial innovation. So A, that's going to allow you to expand on this business. 
but also it's going to make you more vulnerable to the financial cycles. So that's exactly what they find in the in their chapter, kind of like motivated by by uh, theories in in finance. And I mentioned the chapter for Chile briefly before. This is the legacy of the Pinochet regime, uh, but Felipe Gonzalez and Monu Prem, two of the foremost experts on this topic uh, uh, on Chile. Uh, and the idea is that what about modern authoritarian legacies so in the 20th century? And it's hard to think about them. It's hard to eradicate their legacies. How do we think about repression in a modern day context? If you think about this, most of the violence was in the 70s. So they look at the Chilean experience not only from an economic history, but also an economic and political uh, um, uh, framework. So you have kind of like the rise and fall uh, of the regime, and they emphasize there the role of collaborators. Uh, and how do you think about economic persistence after democratization? So there's a lot of debate of what happens to GDP, what happens to inequality. You can see the graphs there, uh, but also political persistence. So in the case of Felipe's work, how, what is the political influence of firms? And in the case of Mono's work also, what is the persistence in terms of politicians and majors? Like, is there a renewal on the political elites? I mean, we already saw the commercial elites in Antioquia, which, is, which are very much um, a present today, similar for the political elites in Chile. So how, at the end, they tie protests and institutional legacy, and like how the latest wave of protests can be tied to some of these uh, legacies of the Pinochet regime. Obviously, as you know, they're right now discussing whether or not to change the constitution that is a legacy from the Pinochet regime. And I already mentioned this, so let me just go briefly. This is a, a work with Moises Pedroso, where we look uh, at the article I already showed you on uh, Jesuit missionaries and human capital persistence, but also on the uh, Triple Alliance War. This is joint work with Jen Alex Garcia, Laura Stretcher, and Jessica Shu, where we look about, so not only at the missionaries, but also the soldiers in what we called the making or the forging of modern Paraguay. So we already I showed you that missions increased education and income, uh, but also this war led to an unprecedented sex ratio imbalance. So let me just show you here how at the national level we could have up to four females per male. Obviously, it should be 50-50, so one to one. But if you have a massive gender shock coming from conflict, how does that play about? So the short-term war leads to more out of wedlock births. In the medium term, you have more female education. In the very, very long term, you have more female single-headed households. So the institution of concubinato uh, nowadays in Paraguay. So, and we also stress in this chapter, not only like the identification, econometric identification part, but as I was telling you before, mechanisms of transmission. So occupational persistence, intergenerational transmission, indigenous assimilation in the case of missions, but also marriage markets and marriage markets competition, these models of competition about like the age gap when you marry, so how the war is affecting marriage markets kind of in the more micro sense and how that obviously could have a, not only demographic but economic uh, and social effects in the longer term. Okay, the chapter for Uruguay, very close but very different in, in terms uh, uh, of, of what they're doing there economically, is the rise of what they call a monocentric economy. This is work by Emiliano Travieso uh, and Alfonso Herranz, uh, also uh, out of Barcelona, uh, and they think about urban primacy. So there is excessive concentration in one city, uh, and this is not only in Uruguay, but it seems to be a Latin American phenomenon. If you think about Mexico City, if you think about Sao Paulo, Bogota, uh, but this is a defining feature of the, of the Uruguayan economy. So if you have a map of Uruguay at night, as you have here, there is Montevideo and little else. Okay, I, I mean, unless you're from Uruguay, it would be hard for you to mention other cities in, in, in Uruguay. Just think about that for a second, right? Like, I mean, it's almost like countries that are majority, like by and large, one city, okay? And how the lack of intermediate cities has been an obstacle to development. So I'm not saying that it's bad to have a big city, but what if you don't have these other cities? Okay, so that's quite interesting. Uh, and they track that to the excess of urban primacy. 
uh, mostly thinking about the railway network. So it's a railway network, network, as you can see here, kind of like mostly connecting Montevideo to other cities, which you see the names here in case that you are thinking what are other cities in Uruguay. So the absence of other cities are going to have implications when you think about kind of like increasing returns to scale, economies of agglomeration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so how labor and capital are mostly moving uh, from smaller towns to bigger cities, in this case, Montevideo. So if you don't have that like network of secondary cities, then it's going to be like very hard to develop. And you really have to zoom into the Montevideo, like this very like little tip where there is extreme concentration of economic activity and population density, okay? So it's very much thinking about Latin America in spatial terms, which I think it's novel and cool in the literature. Uh, Eduardo Montero, I mentioned him before, has work on El Salvador land reform. Uh, in this chapter, he also looks at other land reforms in the region, like we covered this, this topic quite a bit in, in, in the other chapter. So what are the long lasting effects of a particular land reform in the case of El Salvador? So they create these cooperative rights, and I'm going to show you in a second like why um, it's interesting to, to have this type of data in terms of identification. So this is implemented throughout the country, but it's hard to study because there was no data. And what he finds, and this is, I think, what's, what's fascinating, is very small variation. I mean, El Salvador is already a small country. So this is at the Canton level. There are places that experience land reform and others that didn't, OK? So you can go very, very micro. And the land reform had a 500 hectare threshold. So it's perfect to run a regression discontinuity design, right? So I already showed you for Tordesillas, I showed you for the Mita. So here the idea is like, are you right above or right below the 500 hectare threshold? And if you are, then you're going to be affected by land reform, okay? So what he finds, cooperatives devote less terrain uh, to cash crops uh, and more to staple crops. Uh, and he also has some, some results uh, about how equitable is the eventual uh, distribution of income once you have this cooperative. So I, I, I invite you to read the chapter and, and read his, his, his published work. A similar work by Eduardo Menendez Chacon and Diana Van Patten, now for Costa Rica. Uh, and here they study the role of big multinationals uh, in development. Again, a cool, new, different thing to think about in Latin America, where um, sometimes we say, oh, there's economic imperialism, and this is very ideological and demagogical, uh, but we don't have data. Okay, so here they look at the UFC uh, in Costa Rica. There's a nice map there of the concessions. And what they find actually is that this is the United Fruit Company. So probably you have your priors, depending on the country of Latin America, where you're connecting from or where you're from. Uh, so in that in Costa Rica, they get the, all of the data of the terrains of the UFC. They use another RD design, just like Eduardo's uh, uh, work. And they actually show that those concessions had a positive impact on development. Again, for Costa Rica, like this work has not been done for Colombia or other places. And that's something that perhaps if you're interested, would be cool to look at. And um, so this is night, uh, uh, night times lights. So you see that areas within the concession are richer, i.e. have more night lights at night. Okay, so when we don't have good GDP data, these are very nice proxies. So you just look at satellites and how, more, how many lights are there in 1992 or in 2000. And you can see that there are more lights inside and not outside. So then you say, okay, wait a minute. I thought that the UFC was really bad. So what she says is that they are providing, in the case of Costa Rica, certain public goods. So it's kind of like improving the bargaining position of workers. Okay. Of course, I mean, in the case of Colombia, for instance, there's a famous massacre in 1928. So one could also think about the interaction between the political regime and whether we should expect to observe uh, these uh, results uh, elsewhere. Okay. So before Fernando and the, and the team get worried, I'm probably expecting to finish in like five minutes. And given the technical difficulties, maybe at the end, leave uh, some time for, for Q&A. Yeah, and also so that you think some of your, of your questions. Um, there's other work by Rachel McLeary. This is in the context of, of, uh, of missionaries, but not just missionaries, but Protestant missions in uh, Guatemala. So she studied the spread of the Pentecostal church, which is a big deal. Uh, affecting not only Central America, but obviously also Brazil, Colombia, and other countries in the region. So it's a very like 
detailed study, so she's a, a religious uh, scholar and philosopher uh, at Harvard, uh, to think about who were the different groups that were going, uh, how is the different penetration depending on the indigenous areas, are you learning the local language, and also studying like the different, uh, again, very nitty gritty divisions between the Protestant religion. So this is kind of like the very micro, and the more macro is just this explosion of Protestant churches uh, in the 1880s to the 1960s uh, in Guatemala. Uh, and again, like not only in Guatemala, but in other countries of the region. So how there's like fractionalization, different pastors that kind of like going to different areas, uh, disagreements about key responses, especially the, the 76 earthquake uh, in, in Guatemala, and how there is kind of like that combination of like a Protestant denomination uh, interplaying in like this religious syncretism, to call it one way, uh, with the indigenous identity in, in Guatemala. Um, and the almost last chapter of the book before the conclusions uh, is very cool work by Matthew Curtis and Mateo Uribe Castro. I mentioned Mateo's work before um, for, the, for the church. He also has very cool work on, on coffee in, in Colombia. Here they look at coffee and sugar uh, in Brazil. So I guess very much again, back to our friends Engerman and Sokolov on the uh, natural endowments. So how human capital accumulation and whether you are more in agriculture or manufacturing depends a lot on the soil types that you have. So whether you're planted in coffee or planted in sugar, it's gonna have an effect in the longer term, not only in agriculture, but also whether you're transitioning to manufacturing and whether you have invested in education so they exploited super detailed uh, colonial records and that's one of the things that that you get from being part of the us you have very good data and uh, because of the us control and uh, so they document this very rapid but quite uneven change in schooling so which types of schools are benefiting or there's the, the ones in rural areas in in urban areas how hard it was to recruit teachers so things that i mean it sounds like it's very much a US paper, but then all of the problems with literacy and, and recruitment are very much a Latin American phenomenon. And how, again, these landed endowments, like whether it's literally like good to plant one thing or another, coffee versus sugar can explain part of this regional variation, uh, mimicking work, for instance, by Gustavo Bobonis on, on these topics at the University of Toronto. Okay. And the conclusion, before I personally conclude, uh, is by Alberto Díaz Calleros uh, at Stanford. Uh, and he reads this whole thing, like uh, per persistence, what are the possibilities, what are the utopias in Latin America? So even though, as I st started uh, the talk with, uh, Latin America is not the poorest, is not the richest region, is definitely the most unequal region uh, in the world. Uh, are these inequities are reinforced not only on economic terms, but as we also saw in the previous talk, uh, by racism, discrimination against uh, indigenous people, uh, and in the case of, of, of slavery, Afro-Brazilians, Afro-Colombians in the different papers, different papers that we saw, um, and how this book tries to not answer the big pictures, but go more country by country and see what happens in each of these countries, what happens within Colombia, what happens within Peru, um, and in a way kind of like proceed by smaller steps towards that like grand overarching framework. Um, so thinking about shifting politics, Alberto suggests the role of the Pacific, highly important, like if we think about the influence of China, obviously it's gonna change the continent. Um, how Latin American utopias are not new, he has a, a nice, a comparison with with the with historical times in Europe, uh, but how there is kind of like colonization versus the development of the region, and how that tension has in a way marked uh, our, our our modern realities. And let me like now conclude myself, and then maybe leave. And also I can stay for for the Q and A. Um, so this book presents new archival work, solid empirical analysis, modern econometric techniques so data 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 uh, and an emphasis on economic mechanisms of transmission to understand the region uh, it has one continental study and 17 subnational analysis so it also shows you how the literature is shifting towards 
more specific cases. We saw even specific regions, right, like Cundinamarca or Antioquia in Colombia. But having said that, there is still not only methodological uh, unifying threats, uh, but topics, migration, ethnicity, we think about Bolivia, Guatemala, elite formation, we think about Colombia, Venezuela, conflict, we think about Paraguay and other countries. Others, which I think are new and interesting, like multinationals, like infrastructure development, I, I showed you two nice examples of that, uh, Uruguay and Costa Rica, and how they're, the fact that they're deep-rooted uh, reasons for underdevelopment calls for country-specific policies. So it's going to be hard to say what would fix Latin America is something that it's actually going to be very different if you're in Nicaragua than if you're in Mexico, okay? So missing countries, some in Central America, the Caribbean, the Guyanas, I would have loved to have Cuba and Haiti, was not possible. Uh, but more than that, and with a positive note, which is there is plenty of avenues for future research. If you download or you buy eventually any of these chapters, you can go one by one and see, oh, what can I actually do new for Paraguay? So what are the roles of dictators in Paraguay in the 20th century, for instance, okay? So more than anything is not to say, oh, but he missed these two countries, but I think like now it's, it's, it's more like JFK, not only like what I can do for your knowledge of economic history of Latin America, but what you can do for the knowledge of economic history of Latin America to contribute with your experiences, with your backgrounds, with your training, with your qualifications, and with your own background histories, like, okay, maybe you're connecting from, uh, I don't know, Nicaragua, or maybe you're thinking about El Salvador, maybe you've thought about the Cuba. So it's the time, the time is ripe, there's ever more new methods, new available data sets, and new thinking, and I hope that this book at least spurs you and inspires you to in this new thinking uh, to contribute with these types of studies. So that, formally done given the technical difficulties, but I'm happy to uh, stick around for questions uh, formally or informally, uh, depending on, on what Fernando, who's the boss, uh, tells us. Well, thank you very much, Felipe. So, well, hopefully you will see this book printed this year, right? Yes, I mean, hopefully this summer even, but we'll see. Okay, so thank you. I think it's a perfect end of the basically the whole semester you wrap it up with this book which more or less summarizes everything that we have covered not as in detail so if you want to go more in detail into each of these subjects of course we recommend this book so what we're going to do is basically we're going to end the session and then we can stay maybe maybe shift to spanish and then there are a couple of questions that people have asked so both because of time and maybe maybe we can officially end it and yeah leave it to the end so sure. thank you, Felipe. Uh, we remind you that there is one last uh, plenary talk by Jim Robinson. So we hope to see you on Thursday. And if you want to stay, we'll stay. We'll keep discussing. But we officially... So thank you very much. And yeah, keep an eye for the book. I'm now tweeting the different chapters and hopefully soon you can have the links and you can buy the whole thing or rent the whole thing. And But also chapter by chapter, if you're interested in in a specific problematic or just send me an email and, and we can discuss if, if you're thinking about specific problems, just happy to, to talk to, to any of you.